welcome to our web workshop towards exemplar course design, design process and implementation. And today our presenter, Jan Ludet, will discuss the exemplar course design process that they adopted in the School of Applied Leadership. But before we begin our session, let's go over the house rules very quickly. To participate in our interactive discussions, you can use um, chat and type your questions and comments in the chat box, or you could turn on your microphones and speak. We actually prefer you to speak because we love hearing your voices. And the whole and goal of our CSI web, web workshops is to cr create a community of practice. So if you do have a microphone, please turn them on and um, then we will be able to hear you. But then when you're not when you're not speaking, please keep your mics muted so that we don't get that background noise. Um, if you have any technical um, difficulties during this session, please type in the chat. We have several moderators in this room and we'll help you get back and collaborate. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Jan Ludet. Jan is an assistant professor in the School of Applied Leadership and he's also an associate program director for the master's program in adult education at City University of Seattle. Jan received his PhD in international relations from the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Uh, Jan is deeply involved in scholarship of teaching and learning research projects. He writes for the Ivory Tower, an international relations blog and he's also a founding me member of Ilkmade, which is a social network site for political science scholars, journal uh, journalists and practitioners. And we will also have Whitney Boswell helping Jan with, um, with the session. So together they will be talking about the design process for exemplary courses. And without further ado, Jan and Whitney, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all had a restful weekend and you're ready to talk exemplary course design, process and implementation. Um, I welcome you to um, not down any questions that you may have, anything that is uh, context specific to, your, to the work you're involved in in um, relation to designing exemplary courses. <coughs> um, just as a way to provide you an overview with the today's webinar, um, what you will be introduced to is uh, a process that we implement in the School of Applied Leadership, both in the doctoral and master's program. And um, this uh, example is redesigned process based on best practice standards, research and instructional design principles uh, that we developed in the School of Applied Leadership. And uh, I want to really emphasize that everything that we've done is uh, in order to center um, and promote student learning and success. So everything we've been uh, thinking about is uh, what does this do for our students and how can we support their learning. <clears throat> and this entire example of redesign is also one that is understood and delivered for continuous quality improvement. Um, nothing is ever perfect, no course ever will be, um, but it's about being able to implement sustainable um, redesign in any type of program uh, that you may work in. Um, I hope that, and this is the anticipation here, that um, this session will inform a collaborative, iterative, and peer review process at CityU. Um, really, when it comes to exemplary course design, it de it's dependent on many actors, whether it's the subject matter experts, whether it's the e-learning team and um, the library, and others who are involved in really creating these uh, types of courses. Uh, so it's very much understood as a team effort. Now, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, please uh, uh, jot down any notes, any challenges and opportunities you foresee in your own context as we move through this presentation. Um, and uh, we'll be able to discuss these either at the end, but uh, feel free to um, field your questions at any time. Now, this first step uh, that I undertook uh, when I started here last year was uh, a thorough course review. And for that, um, 
I researched the exemplary standards rubrics that are available, and uh, there are a couple that I will introduce you to that our exemplary standards are based on. And also research best practices of design principles. How do you design, look, and feel the consistency within the course shell um, to make them exemplary? And this research that led to step two, which is to report and recommend on my course review, and which leads to step three, and that is to build out short-term, medium, and long-term deliverables. Um, um, different courses and programs are at different stages. So thinking about a, uh, a manageable process of implementing those short-term changes that you can do, uh, and then moving into the medium and long-term deliverables as well. So this is the way that this presentation is ultimately structured following these, these steps um, that I've just outlined. Now, when it comes to the exemplary standards, there are two industry standards that we really based our review on and that also filtered into the um, construction and the formulation of CDU exemplary standards. And those are on the one hand the quality matters uh, exemplary reviews. Those are based on eight general standards, um, which 43 specific substandards of which 21 are considered essential. And in the uh, rubrics, they're weighted from 0.5 to 3 points. Um, and the other one is the Blackboard Exemplary Standard. They have four major areas, 17 subcategories, numeric scores from exemplary to non-evident. Um, Feel free to explore those. Uh, those can be found easily online by uh, searching either Quality Matters or Blackboard exemplary rubrics. Now, one thing that's very interesting uh, in relation to these two uh, industry standards is that there's considerable synergy between them. That is, they all focus on learning objectives and alignment and assessments and uh, uh, they all focus on formative and summative assessment. They're all focusing on issues such as universal design and accessibility. Um, however, there's also some differences. Quality matters is traditionally uh, more learning theory focused. That is, it has a more pedagogy background and andragogy background to what an exemplary course looks like. While Blackboard, which is um, the platform itself, has a bit more of a technology focus. Uh, so it's focusing a little bit more on the wealth, uh, bells and whistles, if you will, of what an uh, exemplary Blackboard shell could look like. Again, feel free to explore this online. There are some great examples of uh, uh, Blackboard actually has a prize or an exemplary um, um, a way where it uh, reviews uh, these courses and gives out uh, a kind of a recognition for example courses. Now, the way that I went about this is to take all the courses and do a general review of all individual courses. And I then went through step-by-step -step scoring both according to the Quality Matters and Blackboard standards. Out of this grew a new standard, which is applicable to the School of Applied Leadership, and there's also one that Whitney will introduce you to that's uh, representative and now applied across CDU. Now, out of this review, I articulated specific recommendations and presented these to the School of Applied Leadership team so we would all be on board and I could also learn what were some of the challenges, some of the concerns, some of the specifics about changing or redesigning these courses. And this revision process, as I had mentioned, resulted in short, medium, and long-term uh, recommendations, which I will walk you through as we move forward. Now, this is the time for um, Whitney to actually take over and show you where the exemplary standards at CDU are located and how they look like. So I'll ask Whitney to take it from here. Thanks, Al. So I'm going to share my desktop real quick. And you should see it now. So I'm going to show you where you can find the exemplary standards that the e-learning team uh, created actually based on a lot um, of those two rubrics that Jan has mentioned already, um, as well as some other rubrics that um, from other institutions. So uh, if you go to my.cityu.edu, you'll be on the portal. 
and once you log in, um, you'll be on the dashboard page. And underneath the Blackboard dashboard, there's actually a section that has a bunch of links for instructors. So this is the teaching and curriculum links. So you have the faculty center links for attendance and grades. Um, but at the bottom, you have teaching standards and faculty development. So this links you to the um, SharePoint site that is eKatrina's for faculty development. So when I click on that and log in, um, I get here. So um, this is probably where you went to uh, register for the web workshop you're in right now. We also have upcoming conferences here. Um, but on the right underneath resources for teaching at CityU, you'll find a CityU course development process. And there's a list here of all of the documentation about developing a course here at CityU. And the last two is what I'm going to show you today. And those are the course design and facilitation standards and their associated rubric. So the first is the standards. This one really is the detail. It tells you what the standards are. It gives descriptions of them. It gives examples of them or how to do them, what they might look like. So each standard uh, might be delineated out into substandards um, dependent on how encompassing that standard is. So you'll notice that this first piece is all about the course design. Um, and we'll go over that in a minute. But then there's a second piece to this standards document that is facilitation. And if you've been through the new NFO, this will be quite familiar to you, as this is what we kind of focus on with faculty who are teaching. Um, so kind of in the moment, what you're doing in the classroom, how you're interacting with students and such. Um, the other document is a rubric to go along with it. And it's a very holistic rubric. It's based on um, another institution's rubric, but it's it's really it's a it's a holistic rubric. Is it there? Is it not there? Is it incomplete if it's there and any notes or feedback to give on it? So this is just a very, you know, I'm looking through, I'm reading the standard so I know what I'm looking for. Um, but when I'm reviewing it, I'm just saying, I see this, I don't see this, oh, that was done really well, I really like how you did that, or, you know, this is missing, or this could be improved by doing this. So this is what eLearning uses as a guidepost helping um, different schools uh, come up to a higher standard in course design and facilitation. So I'm not sure, Dion, if you wanted to go over the standards again, like last time. Um, or we could mix it up and you go over them this time. But I'm okay going over them. <laughs> right. Um, sure. So uh, the first standard, at least in the course design, is outcomes and objectives. So this is the high level course objectives. They're measurable, they're demonstrable, and they're aligned. So they're aligned to not only the program outcomes, but they're aligned to the content and material of the course. So the activities are aligned up to the course outcomes and assessments. Um, and this is kind of the basis of a course. You can't really do a good course without this basic piece in place. The second is the course foundations and student support. So this is making sure there's a syllabus, that it is current, that it has what was approved by the university, a schedule that's also congruent with what the course is in the course right now, um, any requirements that the students need. Um, such as technology they need to, to download or buy, any uh, textbooks, readings, etc., is very clear to the student. And then any expectations, guidelines, time commitment, all that sort of thing, what do they need to know or be able to do or need to know of themselves before they start the class? Um, any support services, so um, anything they, just easy access to the things that CDU provides to help give them that support that they may need throughout the course. And then and an orientation, getting started if they've never been in 
the school's program before or if they've never been at City U before, they're going to need some way to get oriented to the course. And even if they have been at, um, through other courses, each course is, course is going to be slightly different. So it's helpful to have some sort of activity or quiz to help them get orientated to the course, that specific course. And then instructor support, who is their instructor and how can they um, get access to them and help. So what eLearning has done with this is this past quarter, we have, with actually help, um, the base of foundation was done by Jan, um, but we've created a new course information area. So um, all of this information basically is it contained within that new course information. So you should see that in all of your new courses now. And that's something that eLearning has done for everyone to get us up to this higher standard. The next is course content development. This is looking at the content. So once we have those outcomes, we're looking down and we're saying, okay, the content, you know, what are we going to teach and how are we going to teach it? Is it going to be thematic? Is it going to be by performance? Is it going to be time dependent? Um, and really just looking at the content and deciding what is the most meaningful way to chunk the content for the students. So each unit has a topic, it has learning objectives, and it has activities that build to assessments. So that's one of the main keys is it's that alignment, is that um, the outcomes that are measurable through assessments and that we help students get to those assessments by creating activities. So multiple means of engagement. We're helping them not only read and watch things and being more engaged in that, but also we're doing different types of discussions. Maybe they're going out and doing some field work and coming back and reporting that helps them build to an assignment where they're going to do something larger that includes a piece of that. And then uh, setting clear instructions. So instead of just having a link to somewhere um, or a video embedded, to give them some context, some instruction on what is going to be expected of them and uh, what they can do or why they're watching what they're watching really help students be more engaged in their own learning and help them feel very confident in, okay, this is why I'm watching this, and oh, this is exactly what I need to do. It, it takes out that ambiguity for the student, which really helps them in their learning. Um, and then the last two, uh, content is current. We, we want to make sure that the content we're giving to students is the uh, most up-to-date content and that the links and embedded media actually work. So that's a piece that we go through, or we hope to go through and, and check to make sure it's there. And then universal design standards. So this is, you know, it's presented, content's presented in various ways, and it is in dif different multiple means of engagement. It's kind of a wrap up to everything above here. And then, as I said before, we're making sure the assessment piece is there. So we have a standard on assessment. We have the formative assessments that are building. They're low stakes. They can be graded, but often they're not graded um, to kind of help them build to those summative assessments that are a measurement of what they're learning or of what they have learned. We also want to make sure those assessments have rubrics attached to them so that students know exactly why they got the grade they got and some specific feedback from instructors, which is located in the facilitation standards below. And then making sure, again, it's aligned to course outcomes, it's clear, um, and then making sure students have tools um, like SafeAssign to help them with plagiarism. It's a learning tool. Um, as well as help to, in the student uh, support section, we have help from the library. So if they're struggling with this, we can give them a direction to go with to get help. And then usability and accessibility. We want students who have um, disabilities to be able to take our classes. And even students without disabilities having different variations and accessibility actually helps um, a lot of different users. So 
it's it helps everybody when we have accessibility and usability in mind when we're creating things. And then copyright. We work with the library a lot to make sure that everything we put in courses is under copyright and we use it properly. Um, did you want me to go over the facilitation standards as well in this moment, Jan? No, I think okay. Thank you, Whitney. Okay. Yeah. Um, we mixed it up last uh, Friday when I um, <laughs> when I gave this webinar. I, I walked through this, and, um, but the e-learning team really has done an exceptional job here with uh, providing this really accessible way of um, thinking about an exemplary redesign in across the board and across the different various schools. Um, Whitney, could you um, unshare your screen, and then I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so now as you uh, could see, there are all these various standards. And um, what's quite interesting is that after my own review in the School of Applied Leadership, the recommendations are really falling into quite a few of those general standards that Whitney has just gone through. And um, uh, I identified, and this is obviously specific to the School of Applied Leadership, you will, find, you will likely have different results uh, when you do this type of review in your own programs or in, in a course that you're managing. Um, but the six recommended areas that um, uh, I wanted to discuss today are, the first one is consistency, um, then content delivery, learning objectives, active learning, which relates to both the formative and summative assessments, um, as well as assessments uh, more generally. And then the last piece, student information resources, and something that uh, Whitney has just outlined, we now have a fully updated and consistent uh, course information and resource tab on the left-hand navigation bar in all the Blackboard course shells. So that's really something that's already been uh, globally implemented across CityU. Um, but this actually, this is how this kind of came about, this uh, process. Now, when it comes to the first piece, um, one of the recommendations I've made is that when it comes to content, consistency is key. Um, students do really recognize good quality in, 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 a, in a course shell and course design. Um, it also results in more considered content and effective delivery. Now, I don't know how many of you read the New York Times, but the New York Times, when you get it on a Sunday, you know where the sports page pages are. You know where the weather report is. You know the font and the style of the newspaper. That is the type of consistency that you also want to see in a course shell. And so in relation to that, my recommendation was to use what's called the rule of three in text design. And that is, in our case, and you know, that is not something necessarily that, uh, and I know Whitney has something to say about that, but um, uh, for us, it meant that we wanted to justify all the text, use only Arial, um, have a heading that's at 22 font, have the main text at 14 font, and Anything that's decorative is bold in an italics and 16. No additional colors. Uh, that's also UDL consideration. Uh, so universal design for people who are not uh, or have difficulty distinguishing uh, various colors. Um, but it also really gets distracting to a student if they work through a course shell and there's yellow in there and there's like a bright green and a pink maybe. So getting rid of colors. Um, only using black, having the same type of font throughout the course, whether it's in the announcements or in the course modules or in the faculty information. So really you have this consistency. Um, and this was a medium-term deliverable for uh, within the School of Applied Leadership, and it resulted in a style guide uh, with uh, which includes a, a number of icons that I've been using uh, from Noun Project. Um, I encourage all of you to take a look at Noun Project. It's a free uh, website where you can download um, various icons you can use in your courses. Um, and, um, but it also resulted in how to think about, okay, what is the size of pictures? What is the size of videos that are embedded in the shell? Um, so that they all are consistently sized, consistently embedded in the same manner uh, with the same type of description, with the same type of titling, and so forth. Uh, so this was the first recommendation related to consistency. Now, the second one 
is related to um, thinking about how to actually deliver the content in a, in a particular course. And one of the recommendations I made was to make it available in both manage manageable and logical sequence, uh, segments. And this is now something you find in the example where so we talk about chunking the content, content. That is making small pieces available through the student throughout a module, but also that those various uh, resources and readings and videos work up to various assessments so that they're logically consistent. <clears throat> And what we, um, what, what I recommended is modules is where the action is. So all of the courses now in the Masters of Adult Education and the uh, doctoral program in the School of Applied Leadership now have modules instead of folders. Folders, the problem with folders is that you end up having to dig really deeply into them to get to the content. Once everything is organized in a module, the student can throw, scroll through uh, the course material from start to finish is a lot more accessible this way. Um, uh, so this kind of chunking approach and minimizing the taps and clicks was really was really important here. Um, also, to actually provide within the modules links to the discussion boards and other types of learning management system interaction features. So instead of students having to click out the module, outside of the module to get to a discussion board or to get to a wiki or a journal, you actually link that into the uh, module itself. So students can easily move through the learning experience. Um, so this was more of a long-term deliverable and now we've been a year in and uh, this has been largely achieved in terms of restructuring the content in the course offerings into modules uh, and away from a folder approach. Um, now, perhaps the most important piece to any exemplary course are the learning objectives and the program outcomes. Um, just as a reminder, what is a learning objective? A learning objective is a short statement that answers uh, this one big question there that says who does what and how well. Um, it should be student-centered. By the end of this module, students will be able to, and I know it sounds repetitive, but it's really critical that it doesn't say, I will teach you today. Um, so instead of uh, making it instructor-centered, turning learning objective into a student-centered formulation um, is really critical. And the other piece is that it's measurable. Now, uh, that means that you want to be specific enough so the student actually knows by what means I, am I going to achieve this learning objective. So by the end of this learn, uh, by the end of this module, you will be able to recognize three aspects of theory X. Three aspects that's measurable. The student knows. Okay, there are three things I somehow need to figure out here. Uh, so really making making that connection in the learning objectives is very important. Um, another way you can think about learning objectives, and there are many resources available, and I'm of course happy to. Um, uh, provide any feedback and suggestions as well, is to think of a learning objective as an ABC. The audience, the behavior, and the condition. So who's my audience? The students. So what's the behavior that I'm asking the students to uh, exhibit? Um, and by what condition? Is this via an exam? Is this via a short, um, a short discussion board? Uh, by, what, by what condition is the student to achieve this, this intended behavior? So the recommendation, once again, uh, writing them as student center, students will be able to. Uh, specifying the measurement piece is really important and making those learning objectives a bit more tighter on that, on that uh, front. And the last one was to rank all the learning objectives according to Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, so to really show the student the progression of their learning. Uh, so if you start with the knowledge piece on the bottom or the remembering piece, then that should be the first learning objective. It then may be followed by an evaluation learning objective or one that's, uh, that's geared towards a synthesis or analysis. So really reordering and ranking those uh, learning objectives um, was another um, deliverable here of revising all the learning objectives in the courses. Um, now this is something that I care deeply about. 
um, and this is the active learning piece uh, through student to student interaction. I think um, the research is substantial that um, we learn by collaborating. Uh, we forget if we are told what to think, what to know. So helping students working with one another and also being a facilitator of learning as well as being an instructor and a subject matter expert I think is the fine balance um, that, that needs to be struck here. But there's something we can do in the courses uh, themselves to help with that. And the key piece here is that we want to have variation uh, in the type of content, in the types of activities that students are going through, because that really motivates the learners, motivates their curiosity, and motivates, to, motivates them to take ownership over the learning. And really that uh, is also related to thinking about the role of the instructor as as both a lecturer and a facilitator. Now here the recommendation was to diversify the current focus on answering questions in discussion board. Now fatigue alert, if you have to write a discussion board every week on a reading and you do that for 10 weeks, um, it gets really boring. Mm -hmm. It gets boring for the students. It gets boring for the instructor. Um, so think about ways you can Mix it up. Uh, instead of having 10 discussion boards, can you have a wiki entry on week three? Um, can you ask them to create a short video response instead of a discussion board response? Um, there, are, there are various ways in which we can uh, diversify these types of discussion boards uh, that are often currently in, the, in our course shelves. Students can create all sorts of learning materials that help them sediment and retain the knowledge that they have just encountered or that they're, that they're familiarizing themselves with, which includes any type of artifact, the student-generated questions, having peer review moments, having wikis, small group work, etc. And one of the things that uh, we are now uh, doing in the School of Applied Leadership is to require at least two collaborate sessions to build student report. Um, and typically they are placed in the beginning of the course and at the, and at the middle or near, near towards the end when students are writing their papers. Uh, affording such a space for a collaborate session really makes a difference uh, because it helps students to make uh, this otherwise online experience a bit more uh, accessible in terms of getting to know each other but also getting to know and being able to ask questions to the instructor. So this one here is also a long-term deliverable uh, to diversify learning activities throughout the various courses. And relatedly to active learning is the notion of offering opportunities for formative assessment. Uh, as uh, Whitney already uh, defined it earlier, those are the type of informal non-graded assessment strategies that help both the students to assess where they are in their own learning, that is to be able to understand, am I on the right track? Is there still something that I need to, um, that I need to figure out uh, in terms of deepening my knowledge on a certain aspect? But it's also really important for the lecturer because it helps the lecturer to um, assess where individual students are in their own uh, progress uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis other students. Now, when it comes to recommendations for formative assessments, um, really it, uh, it resulted in uh, su the suggestion to stratify uh, the current focus on summative assessments. Include more form formative assessment strategies that would build up to a sum summative assessment strategy. Now, let's say you have a paper due on week four, um, which is a 10-page paper. Uh, one way to include formative assessments would be to, in week two, ask students to provide an outline for their paper. They get some feedback, uh, which is low stake, uh, which may or may not have a, have a small grade. But writing the outline in week two and perhaps in week three or week four, identifying some, uh, some resources that they would like to use in that paper, those are the type of formative assessments that can then lead up to that formal paper that is due in week four. Um, 
And really here the idea is to think about, okay, what are my summative assessments and how can I break them up and how can I include those formative assessment moments earlier on in the course. Now I see that there's a couple of questions coming flying in here. So if you don't mind, I'll just go through the presentation now and then we'll answer those at the end of the, uh, my, my presentation. Um, so I'm not going to spend that much time on this piece here. This is about the student information resource. Um, this has already been done. It's complete. Uh, this is now on all the Blackboard course shelves. If you go in there, uh, you can see this new unupdated course information. Um, the one note here is you may want to include a specific information on your particular programs, um, whether it's particular policies, whether it's particular expectations that you have within your program. So review that section and see whether there is a need for you to add uh, anything that's program specific. One of the things that we, for instance, did is we created videos for all the programs and the kind of overall structure to help students understand what courses are available, how they hang together, and so just kind of a how-to resource, uh, how to succeed in the program. Now, as you can see here, these are just uh, a couple of screenshots uh, that highlight um, all those pieces that um, I just discussed. On the left-hand side, you can see that we have this new consistent look and feel with, the, with, you, with you can see the various font sizes, uh, but we also included a course banner, uh, which now exists in all the courses. And on the right-hand side, you see, side, you see that overview of the module page, um, where we are giving students a clear overview of the course outcome, the learning objectives, which are written in, um, in a student-centered way and which are organized by the Bloom's taxonomy. So demonstrate, reflect, analyze, uh, take, appraise, synthesize. So you're kind of walking the student through this. Um, and here's the only exception in terms of coloring, a due date. Uh, uh, so when a paper is due, we include that in red. Um, so that that kind of just really pops out for students. This is the new course information tab. That's how it looks now. Um, it is here in this program and school information area that you may or may not want to um, include any other type of information you have that's program specific. Okay. And that concludes my presentation. So I'm uh, looking forward to answering your questions. Let me have a look here. Greg wants a scheduled meeting. Okay. Um, question from Liz. Although I love the idea of interactive sessions, many courses have students spread across multiple time zones. What are your thoughts about requiring participation when students might be in the middle of the night or at work? Of course, this is something that you, you need to negotiate with your students. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to my mind to schedule a collaborate session if you have half the student body in a different time zone. Um, Nonetheless, I think it's really useful to schedule them, uh, schedule collaborate session. You can also record them, or you can have an opportunity where you work with students one-on-one -on -one in a Skype session if that, um, if that can kind of bridge that um, difficulty with arranging a, a good time. But I fully understand the difficulty in organizing that. Um, did that answer your question, Liz? Okay, but it's definitely something I have encountered myself where uh, I had to end up doing a couple of Skype calls with students who were not on, the, on our time zone. Are there any other questions in the room from the people who are sitting here? We have March and Kathy here as well. Well done. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. When courses are mixed mode rather than 100% online, should programs work toward the exam? Yes, Ellen, I think, wonderful question. Um, I think regardless of delivery modality, um, an example course design goes, uh, is true for in, uh, in classroom as well as an online presence. Of course, um, you're not going to have to worry about the font size that you're writing on the flip chart. Um, 
but again you want to be readable you want to make sure that your students are getting the same type of information and uh, just as an example one of the practices that I have always followed is at the beginning of each class I'm writing up the learning objective for this class on the board for students to see um, and that is just something that I think is very important um, and so a lot of these practices which we're implementing online I think are necessarily transferable to the uh, to the in-class classroom as well. I will uh, add that the mixed mode and in-class and Blackboard shell is going to look a little differently necessarily. Um, a lot of times the mixed mode is going to kind of it's going to show that you know this week there's not much in there because it is in class it, there's still some structure there but then the next week is basically fully like an online class that module um, and that would kind of go back and forth because it is in class and then online um, in different ways um, and then the in-person class would also necessarily look different but it would still have a good structure give students what they need to know before and after class, you know, what they need to do before class and kind of give them that structure. And I've chatted with um, Joyce about this and creating a look and feel uh, going forward for CityU, which we haven't quite nailed down yet. So, And of course, for an in-classroom, you want to have lesson plans uh, that are available. But uh, overall, I just wanted to let all of you know that I'm available uh, if you have any specific questions or if you just want to talk shop and um, figure this out um, in your various roles. And um, I really appreciate you coming on today. And um, I'm going to hand it back over to Ekaterina. Thank you, Jan and Whitney. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and comments in the chat. And I have very quick, a uh, couple of very quick announcements. We'll have one more webinar this quarter. And as you can see on the slide, the topic is about videos and recording videos. And um, our presenter, Joel Domingo, will share his strategies. And he'll talk about how he records uh, high quality videos. And um, as you all know, we will have um, our City U Faculty Develop Conference in March, and this time the conference will be fully online. Uh, we have a lot of faculty from all over the U.S., um, in Canada, Europe and Asia and this is a great opportunity for everyone to participate in the conference. So um, the, we will have two dates um, on Wednesday March uh, 21st from 12 to uh, 2 p.m. and on Thursday March 22nd uh, in the evening from 6 to 8. So again, this is a great opportunity for everyone living in different time zones to participate. And uh, both days will be a repeat, so the sessions will be nearly identical. Uh, so if you miss a conference on Wednesday, you can always attend on Thursday and you will hear the same presentations. Uh, we are currently working on the schedule for the conference. There will be approximately 12 different presentations, so lots uh, lots to choose from. And we will post the conference on the faculty conference schedule on the faculty development side, along with the link to registration link uh, to the conference uh, Eventbrite um, soon sometime mid-February. Uh, um, and that is all for today. Again, uh, Jan and Whitney, thank you uh, very much for a wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for coming and for your questions.